Alan Tarts. Hey, this is not a test. This is rock and roll. Time to rock it from the Delta to the DMZ. Is that me or does that sound like an Elvis Presley movie? Viva Da Nang. Oh. All right, welcome back to the channel, everyone. Uh, we're going to be continuing on the themes from Simplicity is Hard Work video uh, last week. And we're going to talk a little bit about how the complexity in software engineering has manifest in the industry and sort of the state of play uh, in the landscape of technologies and technology vendors. Starting with this diagram here of um, what I'm showing is like kind of like the OS you need to build modern applications and distribute them uh, on hyperscalers, right? So you have like these foundational layers that the hyperscalers provide uh, of compute, storage, and security. And then there's this whole other layer of services that they've built on top of those. And uh, those are often used to fulfill all of these various uh, components you see up here. So like the service mesh, AWS has a um, service mesh offering. Uh, there's also open source components you can deploy on there. They have their own API gateway. They do container orchestration with ECS and EKS. Uh, they have data processing with EMR and, and some of their other offerings. Uh, they have all kinds of databases from document databases to RDS services, et cetera. Streams, uh, you, can, you can use Kinesis or you can bring your own streaming technology and deploy it there. Eventing workflows with SQS and SNS, uh, ML AI. And, and one of the things that is interesting about, about this is that there's also commercial software companies that offer these things and allow you to deploy them. And it's it could be said that like the hyperscaler version of these things is probably, you know, if there's a commercial variant of it, the commercial variant tends to be better. Uh, but, but this is really complicated, right? So like, as you put all these little Lego blocks together to build an app, you're managing a ton of complexity, both in the control plane, see my last video about all the infrastructure as code you have to write and manage along with like how these things talk to, to each other dealing with things like distributed transactions and race conditions and distributed locks it this becomes a mountain of complexity and most companies are not in the business of managing distributed software systems it's actually a really hard problem you need extremely good talent and so what has happened is like on top of this, you'll get a whole bunch of other crap that we layer in to solve this problem, right? Like, so we get this, what's emerging now is this tool chain above all of these components to make it easy and abstract away what you're actually doing here, right? And and all of these developer tools uh, are have different, different ways they approach uh, solving these problems of complexity, but all of them are designed to essentially like take away from the developer the, the the for them to have to actually orchestrate these things together themselves and stick the lego blocks together and just make it easy uh and but an often ignored part of this is that you end up uh having to manage the tool chain itself which is really freaking hard uh it takes a lot of dependency management if anyone who's a developer out th that's out there will tell you like the more abstraction you layer into your code the more the tool chain and the dependency management becomes the bottleneck and it becomes very difficult to manage. And now you need experts in each of these things, right? It's the often overlooked uh, vendor lock of open quote, open source software is that um, you're locked into these things and you now you need to be like an expert in how you manage them. Uh, and that, again, that's not the business you're in, right? Like if you're an enterprise, you certainly didn't wake up one day and say, I need to solve distributed software system problems. And you definitely didn't wake up one day and say like, I need to be an expert of all these open source or commercial offerings. And I need to hire around that. Like that, that, that wasn't the business plan that I signed up for, right? And so what has emerged even as another layer on top of this, and, and as you can see over here, we have the growth rate and in shitification. And in shitification here, can refer to the products, but also to to your business, right? So here's here's the growth and shitification of the business value, right, being returned to you. And the next thing above this is like, okay, well, we kind of suck at building software, and I don't want to manage these tools. So give me something, give me something that can deliver some kind of value for my business, right? And so we get we get this huge landscape, right, of of uh, Open source software, point solutions designed to solve a business problem for your business. Unfortunately, though, they're not designed for your business. They're designed for every business, right? And you often get this uh, growth and shitification that occurs as a result of feature bloat, right? So like these 
like these uh, software solutions, these SaaS systems, weren't content to just be the one thing they wanted to be and do it well. They now have to keep growing because they've got shareholders and they're publicly traded and they need to grow at 30%, you know, year over year. And and so what they've done is they've rapidly and shitified their products and give you like 90% of the features you don't use. You got the 10% you do use. And guess what? You're going to pay more for them every year, right? And so... As an alternative solution, we get to, to maximum in shitification, which is the homegrown software that nobody fucking uses within the organization that was meant to like some like to sort of let's just make it easier to use these things that were supposed to be easy to fucking use, but now we're gonna have to like orchestrate them because like we we can't even we can't even wrap our heads around this like massive bloated thing that was supposed to do X, but now it does A B C D E F G blah 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 blah, right? So this is the growth and initiatification, and this is maximum software, this is maximum value extraction. So this is peak value extraction from your business, right? And so, like, I've been seeing this happen for years now, where we've got entire technology teams whose job it is is to engage in this process of picking from the fucking menu, like, which thing are you going to buy, and, like, how much value can we extract from you? And then you get to this, like, peak value extraction where the internal team's like, no, we're going to build it ourselves. Oh, you're going to build it yourself, really? And none of this shit is being tied back to uh, how how is this delivering any form of actual value for me? Are my operating margins inc- improving? I would refer you to Modern MBA's channel. He has a, there's a great YouTube channel called Modern MBA. And he put out a video uh, a little while ago indicting the whole big data industry, claiming that big data has not delivered a single dollar of value to anyone anywhere. Like, I don't know if that's true. It's a hell of an indictment. But it is, I think, emblematic of this enshittification rate of software that has become optimized for value extraction and the delivery of growth to shareholders who who own shares in, the, in these tech companies and have completely decoupled from, like, what is the measurable impact on the business that these things are delivering and there was a, a great book written called the seat at the table a seat at the table talks about the change when when the technology industry shifted from um uh like waterfall methodologies of project management to agile methods and it was because the business felt like wait a minute you guys in it over here you keep promising to deliver these things and they never get delivered on time and they're vastly over budget like we need to, to somehow align it with the business and, and the seat at the table talks about how kind of agile software development evolved over time to kind of fill that gap. But like what's happened now is rather than rather than like continuing on that mission to align IT and technology orgs with the business, we've sort of outsourced our tech, right? So like over here, 70% of an organization's software is now SaaS, right? We have we have completely outsourced the business of making sure that the software aligns with our core mission to a bunch of companies who like Granted, they make cool software. They do deliver some value, but the problem is they're again they're optimized for growth, right? These companies are not optimized for your company's mission and delivering on that mission, right? So, uh, and, and I mean, this is just the way the industry has sort of evolved. So now I think we have like a major problem that isn't the method by which uh, IT orgs and tech orgs within an enterprise. Um, operate to deliver business value. It's that they've completely outsourced the mission and we've completely outsourced the mission because the growth and complexity that I'm showing down here has happened so fast. Like we have gone from monolithic stacks deployed in your own data center, which is actually way less complicated to distributed software systems outsourced to the world's largest infrastructure providers. And that has led to a massive increase in complexity for the IT orgs and the technology orgs which has led to a massive growth in SaaS companies who have led to a massive <laughs> growth in value extraction, right? So like we sort of ended up here. I don't think it's anyone's fault we ended up here. So what do we do about it, right? Like what is what is the solution to this problem? And there's just sort of like radical heterodox uh, thinking that that if, if I make widgets, right? If I make widgets, uh, I sh- the software should help me make more widgets, right? And so that brings us over here to Palantir Technologies and Ted Mobry. Of Palantir is the global commercial leader. He, he wrote a great blog that I'm going to leave a uh, link to in the description uh, over, I think it's over here. Yeah, uh, on Palantir's forward deployed engineering role. We're going to talk a little bit about how revolutionary this is and, um, you know, like wh- how it solves the problem of realigning um, IT and technology with the business's core mission, much like we had to do when we moved from waterfall to agile software development. And so, like, uh, Ted, you know, Ted and the team at Palantir and their commercial division created this role called the forward deployed engineer. And what does the forward deployed engineer do? Well, the forward deployed engineer 
works on a, a, a product that Palantir built that was largely used internally and then eventually used externally called Foundry, and now uh, includes AIP. And that product is the generalization of four deployed engineers' deployments uh, solving real business problems, right? So a person embeds in an organization. They learn how the org works. They learn the problems. They find the biggest problems that the business is facing. And then they build solutions to those problems on this wonderfully abstracted stack that does all of those hard things called Foundry and AIP and makes it extremely easy to then put together a solution that's fully integrated with all the capabilities you need, but aligned with the core mission of the business because you've put a person in there who's tasked with caring about that, right? And, and so the, what Foundry, the way Foundry evolved and with the role of the FDE is like, okay, you, you just saved this company a hundred million. Let's get to the essence of what that solution was. Like, how did you solve this problem? And that could be manifest in things like Pipeline Builder where, oh, we, we created a tool that like, you know, helped the average person do Spark programming. Like that is, it turns out that's massively valuable to unlock growth, right? Or it could manifest itself in a tool like Workshop where you're like, oh my God, I don't need a team of software engineers anymore to build these. Um, and I don't need to go out to like SaaS vendor over here, 101, to buy all these various solutions that are basically Excel wrapped in, 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 in a nice UI. I can put those together in an integrated data platform where all my company's data resides. Like these are the kinds of things where the FDE was solving problems. And then those Palantir will, will come back post deployment and, and sort of do the debrief. And, and they, they get at the essence of the problem and then they bake that it back into the product. And nothing survives in Foundry or Palantir if it's, if it's not 100% aligned with the idea that software should help the business do whatever they do better, right? There's no, um, we don't build software, you know, when the when says self-pleasuring, right? Like software shouldn't be self-pleasuring. What that means is like, it shouldn't be like we're engaged in engineering for engineering's sake. If you want to do that, go go fucking study computer science, work at a university and get into research or something. You know, like in the applied sciences that are supposed to be helping business A over here do business better, the metric isn't like how cool your technology is. Like, great, you created a new database. What does that do for the business? You know, you could come out tomorrow with the best distributed database in the world at Palantir. And I guarantee you, if it's not helping their customers do their business better, like make more product, improve their margins, whatever, it's not going in the product. You know? and, and I think that when engineers, software engineers, uh, look at this problem, like they, or look at the way Palantir is put together, they go, oh, it's not the best this, it's not the best that. Yeah, no shit, it's not the best, may, it may not be the best of this thing. I happen to think there are things in it that are the best, uh, like AIP logic, you know, and, and, and Workshop, I think is a best of breed low code tool, you know, that like, software engineers will look at some of these things and they'll they'll pull up the covers and they're like oh well it doesn't do x and it doesn't do y well i think it's time for a reformation you know like where does it say on the enterprise mission that that we're here to 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 a learn pay to have people learn the best technology b build the best technology or or c buy the best technology like that's not in the enterprise's mission the enterprise's mission is like if i make widgets i want to make more widgets right and so like we, there has to be this reformation in technology where I think it's incumbent on CEOs to start maybe meeting with Ted or understanding, uh, meeting with Palantir generally and understanding like the philosophy behind the FDE and how this new way of um, combining technology with really smart, uh, more business oriented people. These, a lot of these people, they, maybe they coded a little bit in college, but they're not software engineers. How, how we actually go out and reform software engineers who are now innumerable in organizations and make them more like an FDE. It's a, it's not just, um, this isn't just about Palantir. It's a broader industry trend where I think in a few years, there's going to be a lot of books and a lot of writing about, um, you know, this realignment that is taking place. And it's, it's like, why does an enterprise need, um, you know, software engineers? <laughs> I kind of don't think they do. I think, I think at the end of the day, like so software, you need people who understand software and its capabilities. I don't think you need people who are the best at like trying to maintain databases or build their own or like do distributed transactions or like build from scratch a whole front end UI and react. Like, I don't think that that, that aligns well. And what is happening is with these new abstractions that are coming, uh, we can call it like super cloud technologies like Palantir. I think there will be a realignment. I think the, the model will shift more from someone from going out and hiring CS grads to like more like MBAs with some coding background 
who are just extremely smart and take ownership of problems. And that will become what today is the IT org. And there's quite a few articles that have sort of come out recently writing about like how your IT organization won't exist in 10 years. It'd just be completely different and transformed. I happen to think that's true. And the AI trend is accelerating that, right? So like we have this AI trend now that is showing that you know, for certain domains and tasks in software engineering, it is absolutely feasible to have AI write the thing from start to finish. Um, at, and there are tools like Cursor and other tools that are coming out for engineers that are making this process of writing code much easier. With a platform like Palantir, you can actually speak in a DSL that is capable of solving almost all categories of the problems an enterprise is going to need to solve. And that DSL is much easier to teach a model. So like, for example, Workshop uses a JSON schema uh, to describe a lot of the layout and the behaviors of the, the UI components. It's much easier for me to teach a model that DSL and rapidly build a Workshop application from natural language than it is to like write it in React because the error rates are gonna be much, much higher. And often what people are doing is grounding models in a code base to kind of drive out those errors and, and like put them on guardrails to build code in a certain way. But eventually I think a lot of people are gonna land on like, oh, it's a DSL is actually a really powerful uh, way to use large language models. And it's how I do reasoning, by the way, like in my own, I'll put out a video on text to action and Foundry soon. But like my own text to action solutions leverage a DSL, right? So like, I think that um, we're all kind of, uh, there's this massive wave in AI that is like pushing everyone towards this future where we don't want to have like, innumerable amounts of software engineers and outsourcing of our technology. We, we want to leverage the, the tools that exist today, including AI to like drive that cost out of our business and realign the mission to be focused on like, how do we actually reindustrialize as Sean would put it, right? We want to reindustrialize the United States and the West using technology. And the only way we're going to get there is if people start realizing this is, this is the, the OODA loop. You know, like this is the new OODA loop, you know, like, okay, I make widgets. Software should help me make more widgets. Okay, let's build FDE model. Let's adapt a super cloud abstraction. Palantir is the best in my opinion. And let's realign engineering with the business. And every lesson learned goes back into this loop, right? Like this is the future in my opinion. And it is, it, and the reason it, that it's gonna happen and the reason it's gonna win is because ultimately at the end of the day, the people who are responsible for the organization are the CEOs, not the CIOs or the CTOs. And this has happened before, it's gonna happen again. And that's why I always say like, you know, whatever the stock is doing, I don't care. I know where Palantir is gonna end up and it's gonna end up here because they've they had this secret a long time ago that like if we could just align the, the engineering with the business, we're, we could actually deliver value rather than extract value. And that is a massive secret to have had and like, it's been kept for so long and now it's finally out. And I think it, it's like a breath of fresh air. When you when you listen to the people at AIPCon and to the CEOs talk about why they like Foundry, why they like Palantir, it's, it's all based around the business value being delivered. And I just don't hear that at, at a lot of other conferences or when I talk personally with a lot of other leaders in, in industry. So like, I, you know, at the end of the day, in my opinion, what's coming is a realignment in enterprise technology driven largely by AI uh, and also these super cloud abstractions like Palantir. And I think that like in a few years, like you're going to start seeing things at Stanford being taught around this model. I can almost bet you that like eventually there'll be these courses embedded in CS programs or or maybe MBA programs more appropriately where like learn what forward deployed engineering is and how to use super clouds and how to use AI as a as a master of a domain that has a subject matter expert in business or a particular part of business, particular part of injury, industry to build your own solutions, leveraging the best technology available. So that's all I got for today. Um, yeah, and I hope you guys liked the video. I'll leave links in the descriptions for all the content I think you should check out, including the article from, from Ted, which is like a must read. Um, and yeah, have a great weekend.